हेलो एंड वेलकम टू बाइजूज एग्जाम प्रेप आई एस आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू द हिंदू न्यूज पेपर एनालिसिस फॉर टुडे ऑल्सो रिमाइंडिंग यू दिस सैटरडे लाइव एट 6 पी एम ऑन अ बाइजूज एग्जाम प्रेप ऐप वी हैव अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वर्कशॉप फॉर ऑल ऑफ यू इन दिस वर्कशॉप वी विल बी डिस्कसिंग द मोस्ट अप्रोप्रिएट सिक्स मंथ स्ट्रैटेजी बिफोर द प्रिलिम्स ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री अराइव एज यू नो ट्वेंटी एथ ऑफ मे ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री इज वेन यू हैव द प्रिलिम्स एग्जामिनेशन यू हैव ऑलमोस्ट सिक्स मंथ्स टू गो सो वॉट शुड बी योर स्ट्रैटेजी फॉरवर्ड दैट इज वॉट वी विल बी डिस्कसिंग इन दिस वर्कशॉप द लिंक टू रजिस्टर इन दिस वर्कशॉप इज गिवन इन द डिस्क्रिप्शन ऑफ द वीडियो डू क्लिक ऑन दैट एंड रजिस्टर इन लार्ज नंबर्स Now let's begin with the first article that is written by Mr. Shashi Tharoor, who has been a member of Parliament for the third time now. This article, as the heading suggests, is based on the recent judgment by the Supreme Court of India, where the court actually upheld the 10% EWS reservation that has been given by the Government of India through the 103rd Constitutional Amendment Act. Now, as you know. this constitution amendment ever since it came into being and the reservation that it gave to the economically weaker section of the society has been a topic of big big debate recently the supreme court finally said that there is nothing wrong in this reservation the five judge bench with a 3 is to 2 judgment in which three judges said that yes there is nothing unconstitutional with it while two judges actually decided to go against it now this was not the only question that the supreme court had to answer apart from answering whether or not 10% ews reservation should be allowed or not the other question that had to be answered was whether or not in this reservation the sc st obc would also be included or whether this reservation is only for those who come from the unreserved category answering this the supreme court said that this is only for the unreserved category and not for those who already have reservation benefits under sc st obc quotas now shashi tharoor here is writing this article not really based on this particular judgment he is saying that because the question of reservation again is in the news we must actually go back to a 2015 judgment now in 2015 the judgment of the supreme court was mainly about the congress government's decision to include the jats in the central list of the obc now as you know the upa government that is a congress government had included jats in the obc list giving them obc reservation benefits but the supreme court had struck it down the supreme court in that judgment had said that while deciding whether or not to give reservation benefits the government of india should not judge if a class is backward or not based on their own perception meaning that if the jats for example say that we are backward we want reservation that should not be how government decides that yes they are backwards the government should actually take into consideration many other criteria their social status their education status the condition of where they are living how they are living all that has to be taken into consideration rather than just believing that particular class of citizens who say that yes we are backwards the author here says that the supreme court in fact told the government that in the future if the government has to bring in any reservation they should clearly first define how is this class of citizens backwards and what are the criteria that they are using as for shashi tharoor in the ews reservation also this has not been done that is why he is saying that with ews reservation now given a go ahead this will actually set a very very dangerous precedent because now there is no limit on who can get reservation benefits from the government and the government can actually make a new class of citizens whenever they want because in the ews reservation also you have not said that people belonging to a certain caste or certain group will get reservation you are just basing it on their economic backwardness the supreme court had actually said in that 2015 judgment that neither education nor economic backwardness alone should be taken into consideration social backwardness must include a large number of factors and this is what the supreme court had said that the government must justify reservations by telling why exactly are they giving reservation to any class of people and he is saying that because now the ews reservation is a reality and is here to stay we might see many many other reservations coming up the supreme court also in this case in fact had said that the 50% limit that it has imposed in the indra sahani case even that 50% limit is breachable because as you know the ews reservation of 10% goes beyond the 50% limit which the supreme court has allowed it to be broken this in fact gives a direct signal to many state governments 
In fact, ever since the Supreme Court judgment came up, you might have seen in the newspapers, multiple state governments have already announced that we are very happy that now we are also announcing reservation for many other people because Supreme Court has said that we don't need to abide by the 50% limit. So they are also happy in this regard. Now, I'm sure all of you know, this is how you become eligible for the 10% EWS reservation. If you fulfill these criteria, that is, you don't have a household income of 8 lakh rupees, you don't have agricultural land of 5 acres or more. Now, in this criteria, the one criteria that has been under a lot of discussion and debate is the first one. The Supreme Court has asked the government time and time again, how did you calculate that 8 lakh per year should be the criteria? What is the logic behind it? Did you do any research? Were there any studies conducted? And the government has not given any concrete answer to that. So, so far, this 8 lakh per year limit seems to be arbitrary and not very, very well defined. Now, there are a lot of concerns with the EWS reservation specifically. I just wanted to bring your attention to a couple of them. First is the unavailability of data. As I said, the government of India has not been able to justify how did they arrive and what calculation did they use for 8 lakh per year criteria. There is no data on that. Also, there is no data on how many individuals exactly or how many families exactly in India are there who actually lie under this criteria. That is, they are earning less than 8 lakh rupees per year. So there is no perfect availability of data on that count. Second, the criteria is very arbitrary. There are no studies conducted by the government of India. As I said, the statistics also show that the per capita income also differs from state to state. So in Goa, per capita income might be much, much lower as compared to other states such as Bihar or UP. That is why you cannot have just one income criteria for people living across the country. These are some of the concerns that have still not been answered. One more thing that the Supreme Court had actually said, which many people have been arguing, is that yes, reservation is fine and you can actually allow this to ensure that whoever has been discriminated against in the past, something right is done to them. But the Supreme Court also said that this cannot be permanent. There has to be a time limit fixed on this and you have to decide for how long will the reservation continue. As you know, even the SCS reservation when the Constitution of India began was only to be given for 10 year time period. It has thus been extended since then. And Supreme Court says that there has to be a time limit on that as well. The next article that we have is about the police system in respective states. Now, what the author is saying is, recently the Ministry of Home Affairs actually called a conference, that is last month in October. Now, in this conference that was called in Delhi, we saw participation from home ministers of different states, police chiefs of different states, but there were some high level officials that came in. One notable exception was West Bengal as expected that does not really have great relations with the central government. No high level official came in from West Bengal. Their reason was that they are occupied with Durga Puja related preparations which is a huge festival in the state. That is why they could not come. However, the author is saying that that may be fine and we might say that the state is not lying but the fact remains that in the state governments for the police to work properly they must actually have proper coordination with the central government. Recently there were also issues with the Coimbatore blast case in Tamil Nadu as you would know. There have been a lot of debate and discussions about whether or not the Tamil Nadu state is properly investigating the case or not. There are allegations that Tamil Nadu state government has not been updating the NIA, which is a premier anti-terror investigating agency of the government of India. There are talks that the Tamil Nadu government has not been able to fulfill the duty that was given to them with respect to investigating of this case. This is just one of the many, many examples of states coming against the central government and the state's police actually coming against the central government agencies. The author says that this should not happen. In order for the country to have a sound police system, we must have proper cooperation between the two. He goes back to the time of India's first Home Minister, Sadar Vallabhai Patel, also considered as a father of India's civil services. He says that when India became independent, there was a lot of pressure on Vallabhai Patel to actually disband the Indian civil service and the Indian police service. Why? Because they were seen as British era things. They were seen as mechanisms through which the government actually controls the states. 
but Sadar Vallabhai Patel saw value in them and he actually continued this. Now, if we have to honor his legacy, we cannot allow these things to be misused just because the center and the state governments don't go hand to hand. That is why there is time to now look into this issue. Yes, the states may have control over the police. Police, as you know, is a state subject. But even then, we have seen how the center helps the states in many cases. They bring in support in the form of CRPF, BSF, ITBP, CISF. Thus, we must follow similar examples. The center government must not misuse agencies such as CBI and must understand that while police and law and order may be a state subject, the responsibility of the entire country living peacefully and within law and order is with the center government as well. Now, I also wanted to bring attention to some of the other aspects of cooperative federalism. As you know, Cooperative federalism means a mechanism where center and the state governments cooperate with each other for the betterment of the entire country. Now, the fact remains that it is easy to say that we should have cooperative federalism, but the problem is that there are a lot of issues because of which the cooperative federalism is not followed properly. There is a feeling of distrust between the center and the state governments, and there are multiple reasons. For example, Indian federalism, as you know, is largely in favor of the center government. We have over-centralization of power, be it finances, be it major decisions, be it about decisions such as vaccines, subsidies, etc. Most of it is in the hands of the center government. The Interstate Council, which was supposed to be a body to bring in more cooperation between center and the states, is hardly ever used. The misuse of president's rule by almost every government has also increased distrust between the center and the state governments. Then, taxation in the form of GST, for example, is still heavily in favor of the center government since the GST council is where the center government has almost veto power because of the number of votes that they actually have. In the finance commission also, that recommends to the center government how much money to go to the states there also the states do not have any representation. Thus, all of this has led to a lot of trust deficit between the two sides and this has to be addressed. The next news that we have is kind of a good news about the report coming in about groundwater in India. Now, there is a study that has come up from Central Groundwater Board that was made public by the government of India. As for the study, groundwater extraction in India saw an 18-year decline, which is a huge, huge news. Groundwater extraction means extracting groundwater. So how much groundwater have we extracted this year? It has declined in first time in 18 years, which is a huge, huge thing. The total annual groundwater recharge for the entire country is 437 billion cubic meter, while groundwater extraction was about 239 billion cubic meter. So net and net, the groundwater level actually should ideally have increased by this calculation. Now, if you look at the previous years, you would see that the amount of water that we were extracting from underground, mainly due to the agricultural activities, was actually higher as compared to what we have done this year. That is why this is actually a cause of celebration and something that must be appreciated from the side of the government. Now, if you look at the scenario of groundwater consumption in India, you will see that India is always under a lot of stress. India by far is the largest user of groundwater in the world. Apart from being one of the most populous countries in the world, we are mainly an agricultural based nation. That is why for our irrigation purposes, we need a lot of groundwater to be extracted. Not just this, most of our crops that we actually grow, be it rice, be it sugarcane, are actually water intensive. That is why we need underground water. We account for 25% of global water withdrawals and about 45% of India's water supply is actually sourced from groundwater. Thus, any increase in the groundwater or any decrease in groundwater extraction is actually a great, great news for the country. Agriculture sector uses 89% of groundwater for irrigation, while 11% is used by domestic and industrial sector. That is why states that are heavily dependent on agriculture, like Punjab and Haryana, they specifically extract a lot of groundwater. The government of India in the past has actually been running multiple programs to ensure that our groundwater level increases. We have the national project on aquifer management, which aims to give realistic information on groundwater resources in real time so that there is no issues 
with respect to how much groundwater do we have at which place. We also have the master plan for artificial recharge to groundwater 2020 and also the Atal Bhujal Yojana which has been co-funded by the World Bank for sustainable management of groundwater with community participation. The next article is from Kerala. Now, Kerala, as you know, is a state where the office of the governor has been at odds with his council of ministers for a long, long time now. Now, just to take you back a few days, what happened was, governor of Kerala had actually issued certain notices to vice chancellors of multiple universities across the states. Now, as you know, as per the powers of the governor, governor is actually the chancellor of state universities. That is why he can issue such orders. So now, what Kerala government has decided is that they have decided to bring in an ordinance under which now the state universities of Kerala will have chancellor as someone who is a renowned academic expert. Now, this is not odd because the Kerala government is saying that if you look at multiple committees in the past, they have suggested the same thing. Look at Panchi Commission of 2007, they said the same thing, that if you want to improve center state relation, there is no point in giving university related power to the governor because it doesn't make any sense. As I said, governor of Kerala has been at odds with the Kerala government for multiple reasons. Recently, he had even said that I will actually dismiss any minister that raises questions on the office of the governor. Then there was also an issue about the Lokayukt of Kerala actually having the powers to remove or dismiss the Kerala ministers. All these things have kept the Kerala governor and the government in the news. As I said, Kerala High Court recently intervened when the Kerala governor had given certain orders to the vice chancellors of state universities. Now, if you look at governor's powers with respect to state universities, you have to understand in most cases, governor of the state is ex officio chancellor of the universities of the state. The interesting part is, while for other things, he is bound by the advice of the ministers, but when he acts as a chancellor, he actually acts independently of the council of ministers. On the other hand, when it comes to central universities, it is slightly different. For central universities, the president shall be the visitor of a central university. Their role is actually limited to just being present in the convocations and other important events. There are chancellors in central universities who are titular heads. They are appointed by the president in his capacity as a visitor. There are vice chancellors also who actually undertake day-to-day -day activities in the universities. Now, there seems to be a lot of questions about why exactly would we have governor as the chancellor of universities. Now, the original intent why that was done was because governor was expected to be a person who is not biased towards any political party, who is not a part of any political party. So the idea was that if chancellor is the governor, that means the universities will be free from any political influence. That was your original idea. However, commissions such as the Sarkaria Commission, Panchi Commission have not really agreed to it. Sarkaria Commission noted the use of discretion by governors in certain universities has actually led to certain criticism. Thus, they said that we need to relook into this role. They also underlined that Chancellor is not obliged to seek the government's advice. Panchi Commission, on the other hand, said that governor should not be burdened with these kind of positions and this should be removed as soon as possible. These are the important articles from the Hindu newspaper today. Now, a couple of practice questions. Number one, critically analyze the role of governors of states as the chancellor of universities. Second, although police is a state subject, cooperative federalism between center and the states is essential for its effective working. Comment. Both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching the video. Have a good day ahead.